I don't want no oil A spoil in my shoreline I like fish much better than crud I like birds and things A creeping and crawling Won't trade no more oil for blood The sun don't give us all we need To make this country run but that black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. I don't want them nukes run by them kooks who think radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit. Good morning, Toledo, and good afternoon, Columbus, and hello to those of you listening on the internet, wherever and whenever you are. My name is Joe DeMar, and you are fortunate enough to have tuned into For a Green Future. For a Green Future is a show where we talk about ecology and the environment. We talk about it in the way it affects you, your wealth, your health, your happiness, the happiness of your friends and your families and your pets and the critters around you, the plants and animals, the health, happiness and health of pretty much everything, because we're all kind of lumped into the ecology of this planet. And uh, you kind of get a reminder of that when you do things like travel. I This past week, my wife and I were on the road. We uh, actually went down to the East Coast and had some interesting experiences, one of which was uh, there's there was an oil spill, and I didn't mention in my show it was a oil spill on the delaware bay and according to the official number the official estimates it was only about 300 gallons of oil and so i felt like well that, that's not that much i i didn't you know we have so many stories that we have to choose from i didn't really make a big deal about that one but when we were down there we actually went to rehoboth beach which is one of the most uh, visited beaches on the Chesapeake Bay there. It's, it's extremely popular, and my wife really, really wanted to see it. So we, we got out there, and even though it was uh, rainy, it was, in fact, really windy. I, I would estimate the, the gusts were, oh, 30 to 40 miles an hour, and it was wet. You know, It was raining a little bit. It was cloudy. The waves were huge, like 10-foot surf crashing on the beach there. And it, the oil, which uh, had previously, it had, actually the spill had been about 10 days earlier, and the oil had been coming in on the shore on big blobs. And I didn't see any of those big blobs there in Rehoboth Beach because the waves were so strong that they churned everything up into like this foam, and it kind of emulsified the oil, so you couldn't really see these big globs of, that there had been pictures of in the media and so forth. But when we, but the foam, the sea foam was this brown color, kind of a coffee color. And uh, so I knew there was oil mixed in with it. And when we got back to the, to our hotel there, my wife's sneakers were ruined. <laughs> there had been oil had stuck to them. Tar and oil had like clumped all over the, all around the outside of her sneakers. We hadn't even noticed. And so the oil was there. And actually, I was looking for the oil globs. I was looking for the the spill, and I didn't find any of that. But I did find something, and if you watch the show on the YouTube version, there'll be a picture of this. I found a mylar balloon, you know, one of those plastic balloons that had washed ashore in all the waves and all that surf, and it was covered in oil and tar. <laughs> so it was kind of like the sort of the perfect... Uh, metaphor for what's going on with the natural world and, and us because there was a plastic balloon 
And it was one of those heart-shaped ones. It might have said once, it might have, couldn't read it. It might have once said happy birthday or happy anniversary. It might have actually been released somewhere like Ohio and float, floated all the way out to the Atlantic and then got washed back into shore. And to me, it was just kind of like, okay, plastic pollution and covered in tar and oil. And that, uh, that sort of summed things up for me with our dependence on on uh, fossil fuels and, and oil and gas in general. And that's a very appropriate thing to, to note today because uh, this show, we're going to do some, this is the last show before the presidential election, of course. If you're listening to a radio, you know that this Tuesday is the election. And so what we're going to do uh, after I talk for a little bit, about start about quarter after, we're going to, I'm going to look at all four presidential candidates positions on the environment and you're like four <laughs> what i thought there were only two no there there actually are two other national parties in the united states of america uh, the libertarian party and the green party and so you know i can't advocate for any candidate here because this then it would be con- considered like a campaign contribution and it would run into regulations problems with regulations but i can in a objective manner, look at the environmental records and the environmental statements of all four of these candidates, and just uh, so give giving you information that might help you when you make your decision on who you're going to vote for on Tuesday. If you haven't already voted, I guess more than a third of us have already voted, uh, including myself. I actually voted because uh, I'm going to be working the polls on Tuesday. I've decided to. To be a poll worker it seems like kind of a critical year to make sure <laughs> elections actually happen. And uh, I did, I've done that once before. It was a, a great experience. And so I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. And I'm looking forward to not having any problems. There's a lot of people worried about this election. I'm hoping those fears don't turn out to be uh, justified. I'm hoping we have a nice, smooth election everywhere in the United States. And, and uh, so. Anyway, so what we're going to do is have the review of all four presidential candidates' environmental positions. Then we're going to hear some ads, and then we're going to hear from our sponsors. Then we go to the Eco News and Views and the Letter from the Future. And unfortunately, the station is experiencing some technical difficulties, and so you won't be able to call in at 866-240-1065. We just literally can't take a call this week. I'm sure that it'll all be worked out and fixed by next week, but uh, it also means that my wonderful co-host Rebecca Wood, who had you know all kinds of stuff all lined up, uh, she also won't be joining us. So um, I'm this is a, an hour of eco news and views, and it looks like I'm sort of on my own here today. So please uh, send me some positive thoughts here to help me get through this hour. So. Anyway, I wanted to continue to talk a little bit about this experience my wife and I had. So we we were there on Rehoboth Beach, and we were there in the dramatic wind and surf. We hung out on that beach for like two hours or so. And there are just a couple things I, I noted about it. One was that the shopping strip at Rehoboth Beach was going full blast. There were people, and we saw license plates from all over the eastern seaboard. People drove to Rehoboth Beach not to go to the beach, but to go to the shops that are, are right alongside the beach or that lead up to the beach. And I, I thought that was kind of strange. I know it was cold and windy, but it was still beautiful. And, you know, my wife and I left going there. And then we got back on the highway. And, uh, well, actually, we stopped at a crab shack there in, in Delaware. It was supposedly the best crab shack in Delaware. And I have to say it was fantastic. It was delicious. And just a reminder that, you know, the ocean provides us with really good stuff. I mean, that, those, that crab cake, I can still taste it. It's like one of the best I've ever had. Uh, so we had some dinner there in El- Delaware. Then we went on down to Ocean City in Maryland, which is uh, a fair bit down the road. It's about an hour south of uh, Rehoboth Beach. And uh, we spent the night there. We had a beautiful hotel room with a, a balcony view of the ocean. And then when we got up in the morning, we went for a walk. And my wife looked down, and she saw what she thought was this shiny black pebble. And she went to pick it up, and it turned out to be 
a clump of oil. So the oil spill had moved all the way down. Uh, in fact, the, the original oil globs were washing up on some place called Del- Bowers Beach in Delaware, and it had moved all the way down to Ocean City, which was about 65 miles south of there. And so the, the initial estimates of this oil spill was only about 300 gallons of oil. And if that was correct, it's just a reminder of just how nasty oil is, that it could foul almost 100 miles of beaches with just 300 gallons. And so uh, that kind of puts into perspective the story that we were talking about last week, where there's uh, 1.3 million barrels of, barrels of oil uh, that are threatening to spill off the coast of Venezuela there on a super tanker that's starting to go under that's listing and, and looks like it's going to probably going to sink unless somebody does something about it, which so far nobody has. And so what are the things that we can do that we do to try to do things in our democracy? We, we elect people. We have elections. And one of the issues that candidates run on is often the environment especially these days as we're being hit by disaster after disaster, which is climate-induced or climate-enhanced or made much worse by the climate. And so I went and, as I said, you know, I am a member of the Green Party. I have to be kind of open about that. I'm, I'm actually a member of the Ohio State Committee of the, the Green Party, and I ran for office as a Green on several occasions. So, you know, I kind of have that uh, in my background, but I'm, I'm could going to do the best I can to do kind of a objective look at the environmental policies of all these candidates. And I'm going to start with the libertarian candidate, uh, Joe Jorgensen. I, d- I just want to s- say really quick that I think it's important to look at all the candidates. I mean, a lot of places will literally censor the minor party candidates, the quote-unquote minor parties, because they say, oh, it's just all about the Republicans and Democrats. But in reality, most people are neither a Republican nor a Democrat. Both of those parties now represent minorities of the, the American people. The majority of people, the largest group of people, don't belong to any party. They're independents. But there also are a fair number of people that belong to the, the quote-unquote other parties. And in a truly healthy democracy like we have uh, over in Europe, where they they... Even though there's usually a couple, two or maybe three big parties, they still allow and they still put all the other parties into the mix. They let them speak and they let them participate in the democratic process. And it makes for a much healthier democracy altogether. I mean, I've talked before about how the Greens in Germany are doing really well electorally. Well, the party that is still in power in Germany, the largest party, the one that controls parliament, is a conservative party. But because they've had to face Greens in all these uh, elections and all these debates, even back before the Greens had gotten as big and powerful as they are today, the, that conservative party has chosen to take a very environmentally uh, friendly approach so that they keep their position. They know that the positions that the Green Party over there took are are popular, and so they've incorporated those policies into their party. And they've so they've kept power, and a lot of really good uh, policies are, are being implemented in Germany. Even though the Greens are still a minority in that government, the, the good ideas they have get stolen and appropriated and uh, actually happen, and that's, that's an important thing part of democracy. That's why freedom of speech is so important and why when you don't put in the minor parties, when you exclude the the smaller voices, you actually damage democracy itself because then it becomes uh, just sort of a contest between who can, which of the two parties can raise the most money or shout the loudest. And uh, I do want to report one thing about that is that after the first presidential debate was televised between Biden and Trump, the uh, both the National Green Party website and the website of the Green Party candidate uh, crashed because millions of people tried to tried to log on to them at the same time, looking for an alternative to the to the, what they had just seen. And so, you know, a multi-party democracy is a strong democracy, in my opinion. 
And so, starting with the Libertarian candidate, her name is Joe Jorgensen, and uh, she has on her website, she has a page about the environment, and she pledges in there to replace coal and oil power plants with nuclear power and off-grid solar. And so right off the bat, <laughs> we could see some, some problems with this. It, she's only pledging to replace coal and oil power plants, um, which, which doesn't talk about transportation, you know, as in oil-powered gasoline. But uh, so she wants to replace the power plants, and she wants to replace them with nuclear power, which, if you're a regular listener to the show, um, we here at, at Fort Green Future are not fans of nuclear power. Uh, there's lots of problems with it. It's it's a proven to be dangerous and, and dirty technology. But that's what that's her main one of her main pledges on her web page. Uh, also, she only talks about off-grid solar, which is kind of weird because the most most solar these days is a uh, grid connected solar, on grid solar, and that's where the greatest growth is, and that's where the greatest offset of of coal and carbon based energy is, is when a, when solar is connected to the grid. So off grid solar brings up images of survivalists that have decided, you know, they're just going to make it on their own, and they've got their own uh, uh, power, and they've got water barrels for their own water, and and they're growing their own food, and have big fences around their property and I don't know that that's kind of a weird thing uh, she also points out in her page on in the environment that most pollution is generated in developing countries which is true uh, but she's not proposing that we do anything to help developing countries curb their pollution and it also it's a little misleading because even though most pollution more pollution is generated in developing countries. We generate the second most pollution in the world. Uh, we used to be number one, but China has knocked us off the, the pillar there. So China is actually the most polluting country in the world right now. We're number two, though, which is something. So we put in about 15% of the global warming gases that go into the atmosphere every year. So if we stopped, that would make a significant dent in global warming. Now, philosophically, the uh, libertarians are opposed to government regulation. In fact, they were formed back uh, in the day by the Koch brothers who had coal plants, and the reason that they wanted to have a political party was to advance the idea that governments should not regulate environmental things and should not have environmental regulations just on principle. They should be uh, that corporations should be allowed to do whatever they wanted or whatever the market would bear, and that somehow all the ills of things like pollution would get corrected by market forces. Even though, of course, back in the early 60s and 70s, before there were environmental regulations, we had a market, <laughs> and it wasn't correcting. But that that's the basic philosophy of libertarianism: is less government, the better. So uh, next, uh, she she also makes this claim that the Green New Deal is going to cost $100 trillion. This seems to be a number which is sort of pulled out of the air by a lot of conservative sources. $100 million, $100 trillion, excuse me, $100 trillion. Forbes, you know, which is no fan of the Green New Deal. In fact, Forbes opposes the Green New Deal. But they estimate over 10 years a cost of about $16 trillion which is uh, you know, nowhere near $100 trillion. But, of course, neither of these numbers take into account the idea of what happens if you don't tackle global warming, what happens if you just keep putting carbon in the air and the ice caps melt and the cities flood and all those terrible things happen. Uh, you know, The damage, potential damage from global warming uh, by not pursuing something like a Green New Deal could actually be a lot more than $100 trillion. Then... She says, part of her, what she says is governments should not be in the business of picking winners and losers, which is a fundamental libertarian ideal. The government should not be in the business of picking winners and losers. And to be fair, a lot of libertarians oppose things like nuclear power because it, 
doesn't go without government support. It doesn't go without tons of bailout money and and direct government intervention. It's not economical. Uh, so some libertarians oppose it, but Joe Jorgensen doesn't. She she supports it. So on the one hand, she says government should not be in the business of picking winners and losers. But on the other hand, she said, but we should pick nuclear as a winner. Uh, and in fact. She says that the NRC should streamline its processes because now it takes 30 years for a, a nuclear power to get built in the U.S., whereas in China it only takes four years. But, of course, the reason it only takes four years in China is because China's government has intervened and said, we, we don't care about like safety and, and you know, environmental stuff, just build those plants. Uh, so without that Chinese government intervention, things would not have have uh, they could not build pl- nuclear plants that quickly, and the idea about NRC slowing nuclear power plant growth that's pretty much false. Those of us who are actually in the business of fighting nuclear power know that the NRC pretty much rubber stamps everything. I mean, the small modular reactor design that they want to work on in Idaho that was rushed through in a matter of months. So you can't claim. The things like the Vogtel plants, which have taken over 10 years and are roughly 10 times their original budget, that's not because the NRC keeps stepping in and saying, oh, well, change this and change that and change that. No, that's because they don't know what they're doing. They're, they're having a hard time literally just doing the engineering of getting these plants running. That's why things are taking so long for nuclear power, not because the NRC is messing things up. And finally, her she wants she says on her website – that she will show Americans who are concerned about the environment that protecting it does not require taking on crippling government debt. I added the word government there. And so essentially she's she's saying that somehow we can have a clean environment without investing in it, without spending any money on it, without creating any regulations to support it, and uh, that it will just magically happen if the government steps out of the way. So I think I don't think she would argue with that characterization, I think that's essentially the Libertarian Party's position on, on most everything. All right, on to the Green Party. And the Green Party's candidate is Howie Hawkins. That's the National Green Party candidate. Uh, here in Ohio, you would see Howie Hawkins on the ballot as an independent because um, the Ohio Green Party did not meet the petition signature requirements mostly because COVID prevented us from going out and gathering petition signatures. But there was a fellow who um, makes it his own personal goal to to get on the ballot as a presidential candidate every presidential election. And when he saw that Howie Hawkins wasn't on the ballot, he offered his independent line to Howie Hawkins, who accepted it. So he'll be on the ballot as an independent, but he's the National Green Party candidate. His page on the environment, he talks about uh, an eco-socialist new Green New Deal. And this, I, I just want to take a moment to talk a little bit about Green Party internal stuff because I'm, I'm aware of it, I'm, I'm, I'm part of it. And how we, you know, there have always been some socialists in the Green Party, but we originally were started as an alternative to both things like the socialists and the mainstream parties. We started as an independent party that followed key principles. But Howie's in the in the subset of the Greens that want us to just be like socialists with a capital S and even to the point of being like a, a subdivision of a, the national show socialist parties. And so part of his Green New Deal, and uh, he, to be fair to him, he coined that phrase before Jill Stein even used it. He's calling for public ownership and planning in energy manufacturing and transportation. So in other words, he wants to nationalize all those industries, the energy industry, all manufacturing and transportation, and have the government own and run and and uh, essentially decide everything. Kind of the polar opposite of the libertarians who don't want the government involved in anything, uh, Howie Hawkins wants the government involved in everything and, and literally wants the government to own things, not private individuals. And so he f- says once once that happens, and that's, you know, that was one reason I never joined the, the Socialist Party, and I'm, I don't consider myself a socialist, is because people who are deep into that 
theory, deep into that mindset, they say first there has to be government takeover of everything. First there has to be the socialist revolution. Then we can fix all these problems. And I'm, I've always been like, let's fix all these problems. <laughs> you know, let's not put this big insurmountable thing in front of that most people don't even want to happen. Let's not put that ahead of solving all these problems like global warming and pollution. But Howie Hawkins says once we've nationalized everything, then we can move to a zero to negative carbon by the year 2030. And uh, he would immediately ban fracking and any new fossil fuel infrastructure, so no more pipelines and no more fracking, which is a good thing. He would also ban all nuclear power, which is great. He's calling for electrified public transit, so electric trolleys of the kind we, we used to have around here. There's still some tracks left around Toledo, in fact. Um, and uh, one of the things, there were some electrified public trolleys out there on the West Coast. We were, wash, we were in places like D.C. They still have some. He's calling for heating to go for to be heat pumps. He just said heat pumps. He's got that as a bullet point on his environment page. And I assume by that he means geothermal because just regular old air-to-air heat pumps, you can't really, it helps with heating and cooling, but you can't really heat and cool buildings with it. But uh, so a shift to geothermal. And I also have to say that his environment page is mostly bullet points. um, And that contrasts with some of the ones we're going to hear later on. But uh, he's also calling for a switch to all organic agriculture. That's also a great thing. That's perfectly practical, and and we need to do it, in my opinion. But then he calls for parity pricing and supply management for all agricultural commodities, which means uh, getting rid of uh, the market, essentially. And and essentially, the government would would from then on say, okay, rutabagas are worth this much, uh, potatoes are worth that much, and farmers, that's what you're going to get paid for it. And consumers, this is what you have to pay for it. And there won't be any market. There won't be any buying and selling of futures or, or anything like that. It's just going to be the government uh, declaring how much uh, food is worth. And that's what supply man- management is. Uh, so he's got that. And then finally, he wants to recreate the Civilian Conservation Corps for forests, wetlands, and habitat restoration which is a wonderful thing, and I think actually post-COVID, that would be a brilliant move by any president is to reactivate the Civilian Conservation Corps because it did so much good back in the Depression, and you know we still benefit from infrastructure that was built by the Civilian Conservation Corps, and the levels of unemployment and the amount of economic distress we're going through right now because of the COVID uh, actually is comparable to the Depression, so that's That's a great platform plank on the part of uh, Howie Hawkins. So that's the Green Party candidate. (sighs) All right, take a breath, stretch a little. Okay, now we're going to do Donald Trump. Now, Donald Trump, to to be fair to him, I went to his website. I couldn't find uh, anything on the environment directly, uh, but I also had a hard time with his website. I, I couldn't actually get a lot of it to work i wouldn't let me navigate it very well so um i'm not able to i wasn't able to get a lot off his website actually i was able to get nothing directly off his website but with donald trump we have the advantage of uh, having or some might consider a disadvantage of four years of policy so we, we perhaps more valuable than what he says about the environment is what he's actually doing for the environment or to the environment. Uh, We know from his statements, many statements and his policies, that he, for energy, he wants nuclear power and coal power because he's done many direct benefits to the coal industry, like uh, letting them uh, get around all environmental laws and uh, increase the amount of mercury pollution that they put into the air and so forth. He stated many times that he supports the coal industry. And we know that he opposes wind and solar because he, again, says things like windmills cause cancer. And uh, he is, uh, there was a story out this past week, he's actively suppressing reports with, within federal agencies that show 
anything positive or any benefits from pursuing solar power. Uh, so, so his energy policy is nukes, yes, coal, yes, wind, no, solar, no, which coincidentally perhaps is, is actually Ohio's uh, energy policy. Uh, his policy towards wilderness, uh, basically he has put on the Department of Interior's website, he sort of made that into a campaign uh, website for himself because the Trump administration there is bragging about opening up wilderness, opening up uh, protected areas to hunters, opening up uh, large areas that had no roads or tracks in them to uh, four-wheelers and ATVs. Uh, so his his idea of wilderness is that basically there shouldn't be anything that's like purely wilderness. It should all be available for us to run around on and have our dirt bikes going and, and you know, just hang out at whenever we want to or hunt at. So uh, that's his thing on wilderness. Endangered species, he has made it a priority of his, of his administration, and we have a story about that later, uh, to take as many species off the endangered species list as possible, even though many people are saying the science he's using to do that is just uh, sort of imaginary science. And uh, But to be fair to him, he has made some, in these closing months or weeks of the uh, election, he has made some gestures. He has spent, uh, his Department of the Interior website has pointed out he spent billions on uh, public lands, and that is mostly, though, to do things like build trails and build buildings and put in roads and, and infrastructure of that source on our public lands. He has uh, pledged to not allow drilling off the coast of Florida, and that is something, but it, it looks pretty much like he's doing that because he he has, uh, how to put this, it's a, Florida is a very close race, and a lot of people are, are using that one issue as like a deciding factor for their vote. So, But he has pledged no oil drilling off the coast of Florida. That's nice. And then this past week, he just signed a, uh, a $90 million a year benefit for the Chesapeake Bay uh, environment. And uh, that was he signed that on October 30th. It was reported in the Baltimore Sun on October 30th. And he, uh, this money will be used to protect the bay, to, ex- to protect wildlife and, and uh, wetlands. And the, the thing is, yes, he signed that this past week, but he did, uh, in his budget back in February, he wanted to actually slash that down to $7 million. But, uh, but once it passed through Congress uh, unanimously, I might add, on, in both houses, he did sign the bill. So, so that's uh, kind of... The Republican view, that's kind of Trump's environmental policies. And now, one more stretch, the last one, uh, Biden, the Democrats' environmental policy. And Biden's policy, he had the most about environment on his website. I mean, literally pages and pages of stuff on ecology and the environment on his website. And even though in the debate with Trump, he said he didn't support the Green New Deal. He supported the Biden deal. Uh, on the website, he does talk about the Green New Deal. And he says he's going to have 100% clean energy and net zero carbon by 2050, which is uh, pretty good. It's not enough to save us, but it's pretty good. Unfortunately, he includes nuclear as clean energy. And in fact, and I, I had to read through his website twice because I, well, actually it was the third time. I, I, the second time I read through it, I, I realized he doesn't actually mention wind and solar when he talks about clean energy. He talks a lot about small module, small nuclear reactors, SMRs, small module reactors, but he doesn't actually talk about wind and solar except at the very bottom when he's talking about things he did with Obama back when he was vice president. And there he does talk about how they encouraged wind and solar. But uh, he just talks about clean energy, how he wants to export clean energy, how he wants to put clean energy into the neighborhoods that are most uh, hurt by the economic downturn that we're in right now. And he apparently, when he's talking about clean energy, he's talking about nuclear reactors. Um, Although 
there is a picture of him standing addressing a solar energy gathering but i i just and probably he does mean solar and wind i don't i have to, i'm assuming that when he talks about clean but he doesn't actually come out and say wind and solar anyway he wants to spend 1.7 trillion over 10 years to uh help us get out of our uh, carbon addiction and help us switch over to quote unquote clean energy and he's made a lot of promises that he's going to do on day one once he gets elected, once he gets into office. And that some of these day one promises include uh, aggressive methane limits on uh, fracking and so forth, and that's that's a good thing. Uh, he's going to direct the federal government to only buy zero emission vehicles. And the federal government buys a lot of cars and trucks and things. So that that right there would create a zero emission industry just by itself. He wants to invest in biofuels, which um, have a mixed result in terms of ecology. Some say that uh, biofuels don't generate as much energy as is used to create them, but he, he's talking about next generation biofuels, which uh, which may. So, uh, But a lot of farmers are very into biofuels. And we have uh, biofuel plants here in Ohio, so, so, you know, that's an okay one, I guess, from a certain point of view. He wants to, the way Clinton did, he wants to change standards for appliances and, and machinery to force them to be more energy efficient. Uh, he wants all federal infrastructure to review the pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. So any time the federal government does anything, they have to include what's this going to do to greenhouse gases. Then he, he waxes poetic about small modular reactors. He just loves them, loves them. And he says, at half the cost of today's dukes. The thing about that is, half the cost of today's dukes is still five times the cost of wind and solar. Because today's dukes cost about ten times as much as today's wind and solar power. So it's still not a good bargain even with his uh, with his numbers, and he also is big on ca- something called carbon capture, which is a, a fantasy. Uh, carbon capture means you pull carbon dioxide out of the air, and then you you stick it down into holes in the ground, and I call it catch carbon catch and release, because uh, you the places we have to stick the carbon are full of holes right now because they've been drilled by things like fracking. And uh, so so if you stick carbon in the ground that's been drilled and is fractured, it's going to leak right out again. It might take 50 or 100 years, but um, it's never been done. It's still a theoretical technology. They've been working on it for uh, approximately 30 years now because they, the fossil fuel industry has always pushed it as the solution to global warming so that it doesn't work. They don't know how to do it. But it's big on on Joe Biden's agenda. Uh, He also wants to use, quote unquote, renewables to produce carbon free hydrogen, which could be wood and solar, although he doesn't explicitly say it. Uh, One great thing, he wants to expand rail and uh, all over the country. He wants to expand rail corridors. And here in Ohio, we've often talked about a a rail corridor that would a triangle that would go um, Toledo, Cleveland, Columbus Cincinnati and then back up to Toledo again. Uh, that could well happen if he gets elected. I don't know. He does point out there a DOE report that says wind and solar technicians are the fastest growing jobs in the country right now, which is great. An interesting one, he wants to imply carbon tariffs to countries that don't uh, curb their carbon. So that would include like Russia and China and uh, Brazil and a lot of countries that are that are sort of poo-pooing the whole uh, crisis, he would stick tariffs on them uh, to help us pay for our carbon transitions, which is interesting. And uh, uh, that's pretty much it. So, uh, again, these are this is what I've gotten off their website from public sources. And as I say, I'm not endorsing any one candidate. I just wanted to present you guys with the, the election special uh, edition. So now, take a deep breath from that and sort of cleanse our palate. Uh, let's hear from our sponsors. 
The Wood County Park District is a natural resources conservation agency. They protect natural spaces, maintain quality green spaces, provide engaging programming, and they teach people to love and respect nature. They restore wildlife habitats, and they lead outdoor adventures. Wood County Parks protects natural spaces in Wood County for all to enjoy, from 8 a.m. to 30 minutes past sunset every day of the year. There's several ways to get a hold of them. One is to call them at 419-353-1897. That's 419-353-1897. You can go to their website, wcparks.org, um, which is a, a good website, and you can check out their app. You go to the App Store and you search for WC Parks, and uh, that is a great resource. All right, and Four Green Futures also brought to you by our sponsors. Our sponsors are people who have gone to Patreon.com and searched for Four Green Future, and they have found uh, that there's some cute pictures there of the different levels of membership, and they've signed up for having a, a small monthly fee taken out of their checking account and it comes over to our checking account, and uh, we use it to help bring you this kind of information. And because I actually haven't seen all four candidates profiled like that by anybody else, and I don't know, I may have managed to make people from every single one of those parties uh, upset with me, but <laughs> I, I have to be as, as honest and objective as I can when I look at this stuff, and because the effect on the environment is going to be real you know these policies that they're proposing are going to have real world consequences and so uh, we all have a, a right to know what's going to happen if they're put into place <sighs> all right so i've thanked our sponsors and our advertisers and now it's time for some news and uh the first story this is kind of last night of course was halloween and so uh the the new zealand herald reports that uh, there are escaped cloned mutant crayfish taking over Belgium. Uh, these crayfish apparently can are self-duplicating. They're, they're females, and they, they can just pop out more females. They don't need males at all, which uh, I know a lot of women who'd be very happy if, with that situation. But they're uh, marbled crayfish, and they can travel across land, and they can travel... Uh, through water, and they eat pretty much everything. They're not; they don't occur in nature in Europe, and so. Uh, but it turns out that they're actually spreading all across Europe, and they're getting into Africa and Asia. And they came; they were originally released by the the uh, aquarium industry because they thought, "Hey, this is great. We don't have to worry about breeding. Just stick a, stick your female crayfish in there, and more will pop out." So. It's not uh, a good thing that these mutant crayfish are, and because in light of Halloween, they're they're talking about how they've taken over a, a cemetery there in Belgium, which is infested with them. But but as I said, they're on four continents now. They're all over the world, and some places actually are liking them because they eat them. But it's just a reminder that invasive species, you know, that's a, originally that was a Florida species of crayfish that mutated so that it could clone itself. And so, you know, American species can be invasive species on other continents. It's not like just all these, these things are coming and invading us. We're, we're sending out invaders, too. And in nature, clones like that actually do not compete as well as uh, sexually generated animals. There's a study done of there were some cloned minnows in streams up in in Mexico, there was an extensive study done because uh, this one stream had nothing but a cloned species of minnow, but then a very closely related species that could still reproduce sexually got in there, and eventually the the sexual sexually reproduced things outperform cloned things because they're more resilient. They've got more diversity, and so they can respond to changes better. But if you put a, an animal, any animal, in a place where the ecological niche is empty, like the niche for crayfish in Europe, it's just going to take off, and that's that's what happens. So, just a kind of a Halloweeny sort of the attack of the mutant cloned crayfish going on. Uh, next bit of eco news: SMRs, small module reactors. 
they have planned a small modular reactor setup over there in Idaho, and cities one by one are dropping out. Uh, the latest was Murray City. There was a story in the Salt Lake Tribune this past week, October 23rd, and Murray, Murray City, Utah, has uh, dropped out of the project. And the reason these cities are dropping out is purely economic. They're they're saying, wait a minute. <laughs> We're signing on to something that's going to be five times as expensive as if we just built some windmills and solar panels with some storage. Why are we doing this? And so one by one, they're coming to their senses. About half a dozen out of about uh, 24 cities that initially signed on to this 12-module plant that would be at the Idaho National Laboratory in Idaho Falls. Uh, About six of these cities have already dropped out, and a lot more are looking to drop out because... Uh, like you say, the, the economics just aren't there. Now, of course, as an environmentalist, we say that the nuclear waste is there. Small module reactors produce just as much nuclear waste per uh, watt generated as regular old nuclear reactors. Just looking at it strictly economically, a lot of cities are dropping out. In fact, Murray City voted unanimously to get out. So hopefully the rest of them will follow and, and it won't happen. And, and Joe Biden will be disappointed if he tries to force it on people. Now, HB6 update, and we're racing right along here. It's uh, only 11 minutes left in the show. Big news on HB6. All kinds of stuff happened this past week. (laughs) One, First Energy fired the CEO who was responsible for the whole HB6 debacle, uh, Chuck Jones. They, They just showed him the door. They said, get out of here. They, uh, the reason for the firing is that he violated company ethics policies, although they didn't say which company ethics policy he violated. We can sort of assume it has something to do with bribery and illegal campaign contributions, uh, but they didn't explicitly say that they have a rule against those things. They just said he violated company ethics, so he's out. And uh, I saw a comment on Facebook where somebody said, okay, all you legislatures pushing for HB6, your boss has been fired. You can stop now. Uh, I don't know if that's uh, going to happen or not. But uh, in addition to him getting fired, two of the people that the FBI have accused in this scandal, Jeffrey Longstreth and Juan Cespedes, they have pled this past week, they pled guilty to the bribery and racketeering charges, which means we no longer have to say alleged bribery and racketeering. We can actually just say, yeah, it was bribery and racketeering. These two guys admitted to it legally in court. It has been put down and you know signed. It, it's a legal fact that they... And in fact, the firing of Chuck Jones came uh, literally hours after the guilty pleas of Jeffrey Longstreth and Juan Cespedes. So uh, who knows what more is going to happen on that. But There's still more HB6 news, very quickly. Uh, Cincinnati and Columbus, which both have municipal power companies, have said they don't want to be bill collectors. They don't want to be the thugs. They don't want to be the heavies for First Energy to collect this fee that HB6 would put on all our electric bills. And so they are suing to say, you know, we're not going to collect that money. We, We... aren't going to put that burden on our citizens. We didn't want it. We didn't vote for it. Um, And so they filed suit. (laughs) And we'll see if other cities in in Ohio join on to that suit. But if they succeed, then HB6 would be done. So uh, because the whole heart of that bill is the charge they want to put on everybody's electric bill all over the state, whether or not they get any power from First Energy or the nuke plants or the coal plants that are supposed to get that money. Wow. All right. Well, we are running out of time, so I have to kind of just two more bits of eco news. One is that the Trump administration has gone ahead and delisted the gray wolf as an endangered species in the lower 48 states, which, you know, is pretty ridiculous because... I don't know if any of you have seen a wolf here in Ohio in the wild. I, I never have. Uh, it's not like we've got wolves at our door at trick-or-treating, like trying to get candy but uh, or dress it up like grandma or whatever. 
there aren't that many wolves around in the lower 48. They are practically, well, as one one uh, person says, that they're functionally extinct in most of the lower 48 states. But because there's a population, a little bit of population in, in Arizona and New Mexico of Mexican gray wolves, which are a subspecies, it's not even the wolves that we would have up here, but they say, oh, there's a couple wolves down there, so we don't, so we can delist gray wolves everywhere in the in the North America or in the northern 48 states except those two places. And so, uh, again, you know, we had Colette Atkins from the Center for Biological Diversity on talking about this a few months ago. Scientifically, this decision makes no sense. Culturally, the decision makes no sense, and in terms of public opinion, because millions of people commented on this and said, don't do it, uh, it also makes no sense. But that doesn't that didn't stop the Trump administration. Uh, wolves are delisted, and, and what we've seen in other species, as soon as they're delisted, the guys with the guns that want to have a trophy up on their wall get on their ATVs and go shoot them. So, uh, so let's hope the wolves managed to survive this latest attack. But that's what happened this past week. <sighs> Another big thing is uh, that Trump opened up the Tongass Wilderness to uh, logging. And the Tongass Wilderness is one of the largest intact ecosystems in the world. It's a, it's a uh, rainforest, a temperate rainforest. It's not like a, uh, you know, it's not like one of these uh, tropical rainforest. This is a temperate rainforest, so there's snow and there's uh, wind. And this forest is largest, some of the largest old growth in North America. It's 16.7 million acres in southeast Alaska. And the, that forest, nothing absorbs carbon better than old growth forest. And that forest, just by itself, just that forest, Every year absorbs about five percent of the carbon that we put into the air with our cars and our lawnmowers and, and everything else that's burning carbon. So open and so the thing is when you open a forest to logging, it goes from being a carbon sink that is absorbing carbon as it grows and as the forest floor deepens, you turn it into a carbon emitter because once you cut all those trees down, they not only stop absorbing the carbon but all those centuries of duff, all the centuries of topsoil that built up below them, starts literally evaporating out into the atmosphere. Uh, it can be sped up by forest fires, which often follow logging, but literally just the sun on the bare soil breaks up the, the carbon molecules and the complex things that are in a nice, deep, thick topsoil, and they literally evaporate into the air as carbon and increase carbon pollution. So that also happened this week, and so... You know, the Trump administration's making big things about uh, the, the couple of gestures they're making, but if you look at the whole picture and everything they're doing, it's not very good. And so, after all that, uh, we just have time for our letter from the future, and I think it's a good time to read it, this week's letter. From my great-great-granddaughter, Marie I., living in the year 2300. Dear GGG, that's what she calls me, great-great-grandpa, I know you'll be getting this on the eve of the 2020 election and that many people are very anxious about it. I just want to reassure you that things will get better after the election. I can't give you details, but remember those that are trying to put themselves ahead of everyone and everything else by attacking and exploiting the environment have forgotten that they are actually attacking themselves since they are part of that environment too. It's comforting for me to live in a time when people are living in harmony with the other living things on this planet, sometimes I'm sorry you can't be living in this time with me. Anyway, lots of news. Michael is doing really well. He's actually gone back to work, redesigning his drill bit to take more sampling. Even as we learn more about it, demand for samples for the sink life we discovered keeps increasing. Sink life seems to be based on a polymer, long chains of three carbon atoms, linked in triangles with other elements hooked onto the outside of those chains. It's really weird stuff. We still don't know how sync life knows its back end from its front end, but we're learning more every day. I guess that's what makes life exciting, not knowing what you'll discover next. 
Anyway, write you next week. Love, Marie I. So, there we go. Uh, A letter from the future. Just a reminder that we will figure these things out and start living in harmony with the planet because, frankly, if we don't, society's going to collapse and it's kind of a, a moot point if we don't. So, I take the position that we will. And certainly we see some steps in that direction. We see some concerns, uh, even amongst our our most uh, anti-environmental politicians. So um, I just want to remind people that if you have any comments that you weren't able to call in today, feel free to email me at joe at joedemarforagreenfuture.org. That's J-O-E at Joe Demar, Demar is spelled D-E-M-A-R-E, F-O-R, agreenfuture.org. And take a look at us on on Patreon. Check us out on patreon.com. Sign up for whatever level you want, and uh, you can help us bring this show back next week. And hopefully we'll be back in full force next week with phone lines and Rebecca and a guest, and uh, it'll be great. So, for, But for now, this is Joe Demar signing off. Think radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit for a dog. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that nuclear power's got us fussing and fighting. No, no, no.